So listen, I'm sure you know that Oregon is the most exciting wine region in the United States, but I'll bet you didn't know that you can easily become an owner of one of Oregon's leading wineries, Willamette Valley Vineyards. That's right. Willamette Valley Vineyards is a publicly traded stock and you can buy a piece of it. Check it out. It's on NASDAQ at WVVIP. Preferred stock is offered at $5.15 per share with a 4.27% annual dividend. As an owner, you'll receive a 25% discount on wine, an annual wine credit, and other fantastic benefits. That's so cool. Learn more at WVV.com. That's WVV as in Willamette Valley Vineyards.com. Or call the winery at 503-588-9463. Thanks so much, Willamette Valley Vineyards. And now it's time for the show. Did you know how uh, as all the rage these days, people learn how to saber you know, champagne. And it's not that hard to do if you, if you practice, we, you know, we all have taken turns just taking that knife or that saber and popping off the top. I have been outlawed in my house to do that because we were selling our house and I had this big, huge gouge on the wall because I had actually done the, the saber and, and the cork went flying out so far. It actually dinged the wall. Mm. And I had to get that fixed. Um, and before I had it fixed, I was like, it was so deep. I was like that, that, that cork had a lot of brute force <laughs> behind it. Oh yeah, it did. <laughs> I'm making a face of champagne as I hear you tell that joke. <laughs> <laughs> You're making a face of champagne. Oh, I love it. Uh, you won, you won that round. Well, hello and welcome to The Four Top. It's a roundtable discussion of today's hot button topics in the wine and food world. I am your host, Catherine Cole, joined by co-host Martin Reyes, a master of wine, international wine consultant, winemaker, importer, and educator. So Martin, some weeks I find myself sort of giggling as I prepare for an episode, but this week I was kind of getting chills. It was pretty uncomfortable getting ready for this episode. You know, many of us think that wine is is a romantic, sustainable, and positive business and lifestyle. And, you know, it generally is. I know I believe that too. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in it for 20 years. But also the, our industry is very fully capable of committing human rights abuses and Today, we're going to hear some perspectives on what's going on in other parts of the world from a couple of very smart people. And then we're going to talk about uh, what's happening in our own backyards. I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, me too. I think we're going to learn a lot. And I'm so thrilled that we were joined this evening by two fantastic panelists. Stephen Satterfield is founder of Whetstone Media and host of Netflix's amazing series, High on the Hog, which you definitely have to watch if you haven't already. He's also the host of the Point of Origin podcast. We are so thrilled to have you here, Stephen. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, Catherine. And also Deborah Parker Wong, national editor for Slow Wine Guide USA and global wine editor for both Psalm Journal and the Tasting Panel magazines. She's also a wine educator. Deborah, it's always such a pleasure to see you. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Well, we've got a big episode to cover here, so let's just jump into it. And I'd like to start with you, Stephen. Most of our listeners probably know your name from the amazing Netflix series that I referenced earlier, High on the Hog. And I have to say that even before that series came out, we at The Four Top were already big fans of your podcast, Point of Origin, and your magazine, Whetstone. But we have actually invited you to join us during our wine season because, little known fact, you were previously a sommelier. In fact, you were a sommelier right here in Portland, and you founded a nonprofit organization promoting the work of Black and Indigenous winemakers in South Africa. And we wanted to ask you about that experience. So could you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the South African wine scene and what the wine producers you met were dealing with? Yeah, absolutely. So my career in wine began in earnest in Portland. As you mentioned, um, I came there as a 19 year old and enrolled in culinary school, thinking that I was going to be a famous chef. And um, very quickly after working on the line as part of my 
you know, part-time job um, and including some stages, I pretty quickly realized that I didn't want to pursue a professional career in cooking, that I would actually lose my love for cooking if that were the case. But I did fortuitously at the same time fall in love with the world of wine as part of my hospitality curriculum. I had an introduction to wine. Uh, my instructor was a winemaker of a boutique winery in the Willamette Valley called Labette Winery. And his name is John Eliason. I remember Labette. I mean, as a young person, you know, as I said, 19 years old at that time, um, really has shaped my career in a variety of ways. But I, I went through a peculiar phase um, in wine in that the world of wine in the mid 2000s in particular was very white. It was a very kind of myopic culture. And I really felt a tension, I, I guess, between um, my own identity as a young black man from Atlanta and this community that I desperately wanted to be included in, but did not see a uh, space for myself. And so, you know, I decided to move back to Atlanta in 2007 and start a nonprofit organization to help me better connect with the presence of my Black identity um, and as a lover of wine. And so, you know, as I started to learn more about the history of South Africa's wine industry, an industry that was built uh, upon a colonized labor force. It read very similarly to our own history here in the United States. And I really believed at that time as a 24 year old, that wine could be a catalyst for economic development in South Africa, as the majority of the labor force were and are black and indigenous. Um, and the industry is, as you all well know, such a prominent part of South Africa's economy. So we are really looking to broaden participation and inclusion within the South African wine industry, as well as doing a lot of advocacy work and awareness building about a lot of these wines and all of the issues facing, you know, folks who'd grown up on these farms in really awful conditions. And that's actually how I got into media. That was the precursor for media. Um, this is just before Facebook really happened, but we were we were doing newsletters and, and using social media in the very earliest days to really tell these kind of complex agrarian um, land-based stories that, you know, are hard to talk about with nuance in, in normal society, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And I started to learn um, that food and wine were very powerful catalysts to really important conversations, particularly ones tied to land and race. Mm -hmm. And I think that revelation has really largely colored my career and in, including obviously using media as a way to uplift or shine light on some of these atrocities that affect us all, all over the world. Wow. And and you said that there were some, some things about the industry in South Africa that reminded you of American history. Can you kind of go into that a little deeper? Sure. I mean, so the the, the origins of the South African wine industry were founded upon, you know, Dutch by Dutch colonists um, and the the labor force that made the proliferation of the industry possible were African people. Um, that is a familiar story, uh, particularly, again, from the perspective of an African-American. Obviously, our history is inclusive of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so it's not exactly the same, but the, the impacts are the same, which is a powerful racialized, uh, in South Africa's case, minority who have not only historical and enduring control, but have maintained and protected that control through racialized exploitation. Um, and so uh, folks who have seen High on the Hog and certainly the second episode uh, of the Rice Kingdom, we learn about kind of the formative origins of the United States wealth and the rice industry in, in, in Charleston, South Carolina. And that knowledge and that aptitude 
was part of the forced migration of African people into the United States continent, or what became the Mm -hmm. United States, I guess. And that story of exploited labor, not only for the, the physical body of African people, but also our agricultural acumen um, is a story that was was very familiar to me. And obviously, you know, as a lover of wine, um, the opportunity to uplift and promote the the, the stories of endurance on, on behalf of a lot of our winemaking partners there was something that really captivated me. And to some degree, I'm still trying to make work in that vein of awareness and of reclamation. So, Stephen, how, how did apartheid and exploitation of land and, and enslavement, how did that shape the South African wine industry itself? Yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, apartheid itself, um, the, the codification of racialized segregation, um, in my view, is, is sort of irrelevant um, as it is here in the States. And by that, I mean, this is about a foundational centuries old relationship of exploitation. And so mm-hmm. from that perspective, the the fight for for freedom in the 20th century through the perspective of apartheid is is part of a a, a sustained and ongoing fight for dignity, for justice, for equality and and for land. And so when we started working there in 2007, that was, I mean, apartheid ended in 94. So 13 years after the fact, um, I mean, I wasn't alive then, but perhaps very similar to the period of just the, the following decade after the civil rights movement here um, in the States, you know, which is to say that our our freedoms as as black Americans and, and as and a democracy more broadly are are fraught and and weren't weren't real and true for each each American um, until after the the codification of laws like the Voting Rights Act and and we have to realize that South Africa you know in two thousand seven was in a very similar state so it wasn't it's not as if um you know legislation changes or the names of of these sort of eras change and 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 the situation on the ground somehow changes with it we know that this is the same story and the same dynamic that has been at play for centuries and the manifestations evolve um, seemingly decade by decade, but the underlying inequality is persistent. Ooh, and I, I feel like we need to delve a little bit into the details just so that our listeners have a sense of kind of what we're talking about here. I'm From the reading I've done, it, it sounds like generations of families were essentially enslaved on these quote unquote wine farms. And paid primarily in alcohol, so creating this sort of addictive cycle so that they weren't being paid monetarily and they were kind of stuck in this very destructive cycle. Is that correct? You're correct. So the system that you're referring to is called the the TOT system or the DOP system. Um, and How do you spell that really quick? Uh, it's T-O-T or, or D-O-P, I believe okay. those are used interchangeably. Uh-huh. Um, and exactly as you say, it is a system in which compensation, if you can call it that, is made by way of alcohol, which creates all kinds of problems, not the least of which are addiction and most often seen horrifically in in young children uh, who are born with fetal alcohol syndrome and all kinds of other uh, debilitating diseases. And so, you know, this, this system, again, it, it's, it's long been illegal. But even while we were there in doing this work in the 2010s, you know, this was this was something that was still happening on wine farms. Now it wasn't visible, and and to what degree, you know, it's it's hard to say. But folks aren't out in Robertson, in in the in, you know reporting on this stuff, and um, the ways in which it it manifests are maybe less obvious, but. As I said earlier, they endure a lot of that, a lot of that trauma, the land-based trauma continues to endure. And in some cases, folks are still not being compensated for the labor with no real 
clear path off of these wine farms. And that is a circumstance which has been true for these families for many, many generations. Wow. And Deborah, I know you you cover wine all over the world and you've traveled all over the world studying the industry. And I feel like I hadn't really heard about this before I started reading reading up for this episode. How about you? Had you heard about this? Elusive references to it, but Stephen has really pulled back the curtain here and shown us something about the industry that you know you won't see in field research unless you look for it or you won't you won't be told about as part of your understanding of wine growing and wine making in South Africa. I don't think it's in any of the curriculum I've been exposed to. Mm-mm, no. Yeah, Deborah, you're, 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 you teach uh, prolifically, and you're an awesome teacher. And you know, we instruct together with with uh, different credentials. And this just this kind of stuff just doesn't come up at any point in uh, any wine trade professional discussion. It's it's entirely omitted, uh, don't you think? Yeah, that, that is true. That is true. Like Turkey is not on the world map of wine growing regions. It is missing in action from our our awareness and our understanding. So, Stephen, thank you so much for shedding some light on uh, these practices. Yeah. I mean, again, this is sort of a a former life, but as I say, it still informs my work and, you know, the absence of these stories, this omission is not an accident. Um, It is why I decided to start a media company because I fully believe in the essential nature of a reclamation of of stories of origin, of stories of provenance, no matter how painful those stories may be, no matter how folks may feel implicated uh, in histories that are true and plain and observable. And so a lot of, you know, that ideology for me actually came from the the world of wine. And I talk about this all the time, but I'll share Uh, on this podcast because it's appropriate. Um, But what I really took away from John Eliason's teachings, you know, teaching me about wine and terroir was really uh, this, this notion of analysis, um, this, this basis of analysis that terroir gives wine professionals all over the world. And so as a, as a young black man from Atlanta, whether I was in the Willamette Valley, whether I was in Amador County, California, the Hudson Valley, New York, the Western Cape of South Africa, uh, were folks who can barely, if at all, speak English. We all had a, a basis of analysis in terroir. And so when you when you break that down, what you have is a way of assessing quality a way of assessing more importantly the the conditions and the factors that inform what we what we call quality and that's of course across time and and place and it looks at environmental factors and inputs and it looks at human inputs as well and so i would love for us to have as I mean, I still call myself a wine professional, even though I'm not. But as 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 wine professionals, um, the same level of rigor and analysis when we think about the the human relationships of the wines that we drink, not only in a contemporary context, but in the same way that we know our our crews, that we memorize our crews and we memorize these really critical vintages, it just shows that we actually do have a basis for analyzing and talking about these things, but we actually just need to commit to giving people the same care and rigorous analysis that we do for, uh, you know, the vine and viticulture. Here, here. <laughs> not just, not just cruise C-R-U-S, but also cruise C-R-E-W-S. Exactly that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And for our listeners who don't know what a crew is. <laughs> A protected designation of origin. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I mean, I, we, we need to move on to our next topic in a sec, but my mind is just spinning right now because I'm also thinking about uh, listeners. We have another episode this season in which we speak with indigenous Americans in the wine industry. And this idea of displacement and place, you know, in during slavery, the slavery era in, in the United States, we had displaced Africans working here. And in South Africa, you have 
people who are indigenous to the place, they're the ones who know the terroir, it's their terroir, and yet they are being displaced in their own place. I'm just... Mm-hmm. Uh. It's happening in Mexico too. We, that, uh, that podcast covers... I mean, there's, there, are, there, are, there are many places in which if you take a closer look, a magnifying glass, that, that romantic lifestyle that we envision with wine, it, 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 has, that. it has that, right? But it, parts of the industry break down under scrutiny. And it's important for us to give voice to that. Yeah. There's a particular there's a particular cadence that I think that the you know, listeners who are used to uh, the four top get, where there is a conversation amongst the four people actively around a particular subject. This is something that I occasionally have seen, and it's it's right now where we are mostly in rapt attention about what Stephen is laying out before us, and they're ugly. And we don't, sometimes we don't want to see the ugly, right? But it's important for us to acknowledge it and to uncover if we ever want that ugly to transform to become better. Mm-hmm. I totally agree with that. And I think that I've always felt that wine actually has a place in this conversation and that as an industry, um, we have relied on the illusion of leisure and pleasure and and story um, to delude us from the fact that what we're actually talking about are land-based politics that can't be divorced from wine or any other commodity or agricultural product. And I, I think, you know, maybe would somewhat suggest that like the more truthfully we can talk about that, the faster we can get to, I think, a a more transformative place in the industry where folks genuinely feel a level of not just investment, but a a possibility and a capacity for change. And it, and it looks like advocating a more, uh, for a more inclusive wine industry, which I know is happening. The industry looks so much different than it did when I was involved so long ago. And, and so like the reason that I am able to bring this insight, um, isn't really about me being a uniquely insightful person. It's about me being part of a a racial minority, particularly at that time, which just wasn't really represented in this community. I mean, I remember looking up to Andre Mack, you know, he was like the first visible black sommelier but you know that was like in wine and spirits like glossy magazine i mean really like a long time ago like 2003 2004 um so things have changed a lot um but as as we see and and believe in whetstone you know diversity is actually and not just an editorial advantage but it's an advantage for all kinds of communities and for the wine community i think the more perspectives that we bring into it not only is it a sound commercial bet but i think the industry actually will just have a capacity to improve and evolve in ways that are just hard to predict absent of that diversity you know, Stephen, I'm itching to get into that subject, uh, which we'll, we, we will come back to in a little bit because it's, 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 it's something that's really important to me. Um, but I, I do want to stop for a second here and shift gears because South Africa isn't, is not, definitely not the only nation that has a poor record when it comes to human right abuses against vineyard workers. And the other one we're going to dive into now is maybe shocking to, to our listeners because of the very reason that when we think of that bucolic, romantic notion of wine, we often think of Italy, right? Deborah, you are an international wine editor. You've had your eye on labor worldwide in the industry, the wine industry. I want you to bring us up to date on what is happening in that country, right? Where we, just as a form of backdrop, in 2020, there was this highly publicized, um, at least within our trade, right, uh, 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 article where uh, this natural wine producer, Valentina Pasalacqua, was dropped by her UK and US importers after it was alleged that her father had been exploiting hundreds of African and Eastern European migrant workers. So we'll post an article about that in our social media feed soon. But Deborah, what have you what have you been hearing about labor situation in southern Italy? 
Okay. Well, I know you led with the Pasolacqua story, so I'm going to start with a quick snapshot of where that particular piece of news is. Yeah, our listeners our listeners will need that because they don't know who we're talking about. Yes. So um, for a snapshot on where the Valentina, how the Valentina Pasolacqua story is unfolding, um, I turn to a, a story by Simon Wolf. He wrote a very detailed investigative report about her role and her business. And it was very revealing. And the jury is still out. But what caused a lot of concern was that after her father's arrest, she moved immediately to distance herself and her business, which was very legally entwined with her father's other agribusinesses. And because she did that, it caused some suspicion about you know, her culpability. And she very openly denied being complicit, but the industry is still skeptical that she was unaware of these practices. Um, and uh, the statement from her PR firm, which is, you know, laid out very plainly, says that, that both the Norwegian regulatory body and the Canadian Liquor Authority thoroughly investigated her practices by interview employees and quite, quite thorough, and they stuck by her. So what we know is that there's a culture of silence that's imposed by the agri-mafia system in Italy. And that culture of silence has largely protected her. Mm. You know, her father is under house arrest. Um, there hasn't been any um, progress in his, um, in, you know, in his case yet. But the story is still unfolding. And it will be interesting to see how he is held accountable for his practices. But this isn't uncommon either uh, in southern Italy. I'm, I've read that as much as 70% of labor in Apulia is illegal in that the employers are engaging in illegal practices. Um, and it's basically it's a kind mafia of a mafia-run system, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, agri, agri mafia has a name. It's called Caporalato. And um, it's a widespread system of illegal recruitment and exploitation of underpaid and undocumented farm labor um, run by organized crime. Mm -hmm. And the role of the middleman in agribusiness in connecting workers with farmers is a historic practice that's now become a structured criminal model that is run by the mafia. And it's gone back a, a century or more, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it was always in place. And I think that at some point it served the workers. It helped them organize. It helped them um, it have, a, have, a, have a voice. But now it's, it is, it's crime. You know, it, it's organized crime. And we know that Italy is second only to Poland when it comes to exploitation of workers in the European Union. And there's more than 700,000 undocumented migrants living in Italy who are subject to this persecution, really these unfair practices, these inhumane practices. And that number is growing. It's growing because the permiso humanitario, which is the residency permit for humanitarian reasons, was discontinued in 2018, of course, as a result of pressures from mass, mass immigration. Um, that began as early as 2010, but yeah, it's it's it, it's really been a problem in southern Italy. And what both the Arab Spring, which was really the tipping point for this mass wave of of immigration and Ill illegal immigration into southern Italy, and now the pandemic has exacerbated these conditions. Yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, something that was already extremely problematic to begin with has now escalated. So understanding kind of the waves of migrant labor in Italy is really important because historically, you know, Italy's agrarian economy has had a long tradition of needing and relying on migrant labor. But historically, that labor in recent history has come from Eastern Europe, countries like Romania. And we still see communities of Romanian immigrants in southern Italy. But before that, immigrants in northern Italy were from southern Italy. Mm -hmm. And before then, immigrants... For, to Piedmont in northeastern Italy, we're from the Veneto in northeastern Italy, mm -hmm. um, went to northwestern Italy. So there's still very much a culture of domestic Italians, actual Italians, um, working in the migrant labor force and also being exploited, as well as recent immigrants. So it's a very systemic type of exploitation that just affects everyone that comes along. 
Yeah, I've read a lot of Italian women are part of this system. And there was a big New York Times article, I think it was in 2017, about a woman who died sorting grapes. And she was basically enslaved. She didn't sleep at all. She, you know, didn't drink water. She, her life sounded like a living hell. And she was an Italian woman. So yeah, Deborah, it sounds like this is just something that's completely entrenched. And as Martin mentioned, you know, we all have this romantic notion about Italian wine. Oh, my goodness. Think again. <laughs> well, actually, Catherine, that woman was picking and sorting table grapes. So it's part of the agri economy. Okay. But if you read between the lines, it, it wasn't wine. So, Deborah, you, you've laid out what is effectively this exploitative employment where the, the entire system is designed to work well when, for instance, from what I understand, illegal migrants can get a. Sometimes it's the only way they can get a job through this through the uh, carpolato system, right? Where they get that job through the only way they can, and eventually a residence permit. So there are deep incentives for this to keep going, right? That's the insidious part. It's interesting. There's a recent book that's been written about the carpolato, and in this book, they actually compared it. Uh, it's really rather sad. They called it the California model, but it's also been referred to as Toyotism, mm. which is the Japanese model of labor. And it, it, it has to do with, the, with the, um, the globalization of agriculture and the globalization of labor. And it is largely uh, tied to underlying capitalism and capitalistic pursuits. And that, it, and those are the bigger, you know, socioeconomic issues that that drive this and keep this moving forward. And now that organized crime um, has further been able to exploit these even more vulnerable immigrants that are coming from North Africa and the Middle East, you know, this huge wave of immigrants, 700,000 immigrants since 2010 have come into this area and they do need jobs and they do need employment and they are just you know, at the mercy of this system. And the more, the deeper I look into it, the actually the grimmer I feel about it. Because mm. honestly, Martine, there's new laws that have been put in place in May 2020. They announced the Migrant Regularization Program. The Human Rights Watch folks um, have said that it has failed. You know, they've identified key failings in the regularizations. It, 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 excluded the people that it's intended to help. These mm. people cannot access these programs. They cannot uh, benefit from these programs. And, you know, the, the laundry list goes on. So the, the biggest problem is that enslaved workers cannot take advantage of any of the gains that are put forth by a, a program like this. And when the World Health Organization does interviews and starts doing research and they come up empty handed, mm. there's absolutely no movement forward here for these folks. Deborah, I was so struck when you said it's the California model because me too. <laughs> hearing about the caporalato, in which these gang masters or caporali act as intermediaries between laborers and farmers, I was thinking, oh wait, we have those in Oregon, but it's legal. <laughs> but there are definitely there's kind of this sub industry, these middlemen who round up workers and kind of deliver them at different vineyards and farms. And it's part of our system, and I think they're acknowledged by the state. But it's so interesting that in Italy, that's part of the mafia, and here it's sort of just is what it is. Yeah, it's the West Coast model. You're, you're absolutely right. I didn't make the connection. Well, it's it's a, it's one. I think when you read about it in in this particular uh, book, the authentic agro mafia. Um, and Authentic Agri-Mafia is the title of the 2019 book, um, talking about the rise of the agri-mafia due to globalization. And also institutional racism, it actually plays a role as well, too. And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, that's something that no one will touch. I mean, the, the Consortia of Southern Italy, um, the producers, there's a culture of silence and it is locked down. All right. So, Stephen, we've been listening with the same kind of rapt attention that we heard you talk about South Africa, we are, we are equally enthralled with what Deborah has been laying out for us. 
with Italy. And, and to me, on a personal level, I'm shocked about the Californian model and Catherine Oregon model. Mm-hmm. What, Stephen, I mean, what, what do you what is your reaction when you when you think about this? How? Yeah. With what you know and what you've been through and what your research has, has shown you, what comes to mind for you when listening to when you listen to Deborah? Um, it all checks out. <laughs> I'm I'm very grateful for the analysis. I think these are this. It's the type of of journalism and analysis that um, the industry sorely needs. You know the the last few points that Deborah made, um, basically around this being a system of of capitalism more broadly i think is is accurate um but it's not a means of letting folks off the hook um and what i i mean by that is you know i'm not surprised about hearing the the california model because these are this is the this is the origins of wealth of the united states whether we're talking about cotton whether we're talking about tobacco or rice essentially the models that we have today that continue to exploit workers for $7.25 an hour, for $2.13 an hour. The game has always been about extracting maximum profits through the exploitation of a labor force, sometimes enslaved, sometimes get like scarcely free, whatever, but it all lives on a spectrum of uh, captivity that is based on varying degrees of servitude, where your livelihood is tied to your economic output, and there's no way that you're being fairly compensated for that work. So we could be talking about, you know, uh, colonial labor models in Cuba or Haiti, if we're talking about, you know, sugarcane. Um, it goes on and on, but these are the inherent politics of the land. These are the inherent politics of the of labor, which are inextricably bound to the land. These are the inherent politics of racism, which are inextricably bound to the land. And until we bring the same thorough, intersectional, rigorous analysis into those politics of the land, then we're going to continue as an industry to be living in a sort of collective delusion that everything is fine in the world of wine, but really bad outside of our little community. Hey, if there is one Willamette Valley varietal that is really the superstar these days, I think it's Chardonnay. And Rachel and I are going to taste some Grand Moraine Chardonnay right now, thanks to our sponsor, Grand Moraine. This is the 2018 Grand Moraine Yamhill Carlton Oregon Chardonnay that we're tasting here. What do you think about this wine, Rachel? As she takes a sip. <laughs> <laughs> I think this wine is great. It's perfectly balanced. It's Right, it's fresh, but still has all that richness that Chardonnay lovers like. I think everyone would like it. I agree. It's like a little bit austere and then a little bit rich. It's got a little bit of everything going on. Um, And it's from the 2018 vintage. Now that summer was one of the hottest and driest on record for the Willamette Valley. But despite the uncharacteristically warm growing season, this wine really is balanced with elegant fruit and vibrant acidity. This is an estate wine from the Grand Moraine Vineyard located on the west end of the Yamhill Carlton AVA. And uh, I looked up the vinification on this one. It's quite interesting. The process kind of proceeded in the opposite order of what you typically see, with a lengthy, spontaneous fermentation happening in mostly neutral oak barrels for up to 13 months, with weekly lees stirring for eight of those months to make that wine smooth on the palate. And then after about 16 and a half months in barrel, the wine was fully racked to an outdoor stainless steel tank and left to mature in the cold Northwest winter. So it fermented in barrel and then aged in steel. Grand Moraine has emerged as a thought leader in the evolution of the Willamette Valley's next frontier Chardonnay. And I think this innovative winemaking technique is emblematic of that. This wine really shows how Grand Moraine's Chardonnays stand for the region's potential for this varietal. But hey, you've got to try this delicious Chard for yourself. If you're in the Portland area, make an appointment to taste at the spectacular Grand Moraine tasting room in the heart of the Willamette Valley in the town of Yamhill. Or have Grand Marine delivered to your home with free shipping when you use the promo code FORTOP. That's F O U R T O P. Go to grandmarine.com to purchase your wine online. Enter the promo code FORTOP and shipping is on the house. Thank you so much, Grand Marine. 
And speaking of our little community, I just keep thinking about the United States. As you were saying, Stephen, this is a global thing. It exists everywhere. And it also exists, I think, right under our noses. Um, and, you know, Mar Martine, I've heard you many times talk about how sustainability isn't just about how you treat the land. It's about how you treat your employees. And so, yeah, what are you thinking right now about, about the domestic situation as you hear about the situation in these other wine regions? We acknowledge this link, that it all boils down to not just sustainability of the planet, to the sustainability of the people that we're talking about, but it all boils down to economic incentives. There's a, a, a visa that's designed by Congress to enable a U.S. agricultural business to hire temporary workers from other countries, right? But it's not used by the wine industry. We don't have the incentives necessary because of the way our season grows, our harvest season and everything. So, so that, that's, it's, it's blunted by a business sense. So it needs to make economic sense. So tying this back to our discussion today, we need to have a reckoning that shifts the mode away from strictly altruism and saying, gee, isn't it nice to have the right thing to do? And understand that the business sense of doing the right thing top down is just as important for progress. Wineries who are listening or consumers who are listening now, you can make a direct link between higher quality of wine with treating your labor for with treating labor force better. I got to break in and say, or if your harvest workers are not paid by how much of volume they pick, but by the hour, amazing how the quality of the fruit is better and the health of your workers is better. Absolutely. That is absolutely true. So I, I thank you, uh, Catherine, that, that we, we make, we, you can, you can see that there is, that there has, there, there has to be an economic incentive. And there, for, fortunately there is for the wine loving culture, both producers, importers, sommeliers, wine directors, and consumers to say, I do want to vote with my dollar to buy wines from those producers mm -hmm. from South Africa, from Italy, from the U.S., and other countries who are treating their labor force right because, gosh darn it, long-term wise, it is sustainably better on multiple fronts. You know, you're making me think of some of Stephen's observations in the first part of this conversation. I, I kept hearing in the back of my head this term that I'm sort of I've sort of always wanted to explore more, and that term is human terroir. And Stephen, I think you addressed that a little bit. You know, it's not just the terroir, the the sense of place in the wine. It's 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 also the loving hands. And and if the it, like like you're saying, Martine, if 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 this product was really made with care and love at every level and happiness, I think you can. Maybe I you sound a little new agey, but I yeah. think you can taste that you in the wine. You can taste that. You can. What do you think, Stephen? At the end of, of all of it, um, it's hard to, for it's hard for me, I should say, to divorce a lot of the issues that we're speaking about today from the this kind of colonial economy that we've been referring to. Um, but regarding the, I guess, the role of, of the consumer or I guess a, a call to action around this is, I think, the, the Pasquala story that there's a lesson there and, and the importers feeling the the heat, um, even for a producer that was a, a, a key part of the portfolio because people were rightfully outraged. And we we took to, I mean, I didn't, but many did, took to social media to express that that outrage. And I think oftentimes that strategy is, is belittled or undermined or, or bemoaned um, but we have seen, I think, beginning with the Me Too movement and many other ways where folks who have historically not had power or whose power have been marginalized or manipulated have used social media as a way to level the playing field, to exercise agency and to take back power. And I, I think that we need to start to have a greater responsibility as consumers um, and understanding our power, the power of our dollar. And since we are, you know, this is kind of through an economic 
analysis as as Martine you know was was mentioning in sort of more absolute terms. So obviously we would love for this stuff to be legislated and actually enacted, but absent of that, I hate to put the onus on consumers, but we've yet to see anything else that is effective. Uh, Stephen, to your point, I have to jump in here. Yeah, I'm just burning to segue um, to make sure to um, get Abu Bakar uh, Samohoro, the African Italian that has become the spokesman for the hundreds of thousands of voiceless migrants and undocumented workers in Italy, all over Italy, South, Southern Italy and Northern Italy. He has been using his voice by making a movie called The Invisible. And also he wrote a book in 2019 called Humanity in Revolt. And he has become the de facto voice and face of these of these folks and you can see him on social media every single day i follow him on instagram now and he is boots on the ground and definitely raising awareness of the plight of these workers in italy you know deborah i was actually just about to i was thinking about uh, the, i'm glad you brought this up because i was thinking about you know how could we put this into, into practice right and i was thinking well, will we humanize the stories right the that the, the, we put a, a face and a story next to not just a, an, like a theoretical idea of the construct of who the underdog is, but actually highlighting the story of the underdog as a success story, right? We love an underdog story. The labor force is full of them. How, how, how much do you think that these types of, uh, how much do you think humanizing these stories could change, could move the needle? Well, I, I think that this is one case where, You've, you're he's using different media, clearly. He's made a movie that's a documentary movie that's being widely seen. Um, and his book is being widely read. And then he's taken to social media with a powerful uh, voice. And I, I think he's absolutely brilliant in using all of these different media to help raise awareness of uh, and, and kind of break this culture of silence that is preventing people from living humanely. Oh, well, I, I hate to draw this conversation to a close, but we're running out of time. But Deborah, thank you so much for kind of um, <laughs> finishing up on a positive note, because I'm just, it's been, you know, a really kind of a wrenching conversation. And we all have a lot of deep thinking to do after this. Um, but we'll try to end on a lighter note. We do have a little dessert wine course at the end of every episode where we each just share something fun that we've been enjoying this week. Anyone have a dessert wine they'd like to share with the group? I'm still thinking about the Summer Olympics because I have um, been actively pursuing the sport of weightlifting. And I was so inspired and I continue to be inspired by the performances of weightlifters from around the world because weightlifting is a new sport for me and it is an empowering physical activity that is kind of driving everything I'm doing intellectually as well too, I think. Cool. Wow. I didn't know this about you, Deborah. I have all I I have new, new respect for you and I will not get in a bar fight with you now. <laughs> <laughs> it's defensive only. <laughs> <laughs> I will definitely, I will definitely wait before I get get into anything with you. A lot of pacifists. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> dad joke in there. Dad joke alert. It's not my best work. I'll, I'll come back to it. <laughs> All right, Stephen. Did you bring a dessert wine item to share with us? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm gonna just think of it on the fly. What I'm enjoying right now is is the state of California. Um, I'm in Los Angeles right now. And the state of California has always been very good to me. I spent a decade in the Bay Area and um, for a variety of reasons have, have not traveled here in a very long time. And uh, I just love to feel the warm embrace of California. So I've been taking lots of walks um, and just feeling very grateful to be here. So that's that's it. It is a beautiful place, and I hear they have wine there. Yes, and wine. Martin, what's your dessert wine tonight? I, it, it is an actual wine. I'm drinking it right now. The McBride Sisters. Producers, Love them. Many, yeah, many, many consumers. Uh, wine fans should, should if you don't know them, you should definitely go out and find anything from uh, the Sisters. There's, first of all, their story is flat out bitchin'. 
if you haven't heard about them, go out, run out, and find out who the McBride sisters are. M C B R I D E. I have no uh, affiliation with them whatsoever, although I'm a big fan. I'm drinking their sparkling brute rose from New Zealand. It's a rose um, that um, is is rocking out and affordable. So I invite you to try them out as I am doing right now. They are very cool. Thanks for sharing that, Martin. First of all, my dessert is an apology to our listeners because we always try to cover way too much in every episode because there's just so much to talk about. And we, Martin and I get so excited when we're planning episodes. Um, so I just wanted to circle back one more time because we mentioned the Valentina Pasalacqua story very quickly, didn't get into it. Listeners, if you want to read more, there's a New York Magazine reporter, Angelina Shapin, who wrote a kind of a long form piece, The Spectacular Rise and Fall of Calcareous. That's her extremely popular natural wine label. And what I loved about this piece is it not only raises interesting questions about labor, but also about our assumptions when we hear about a natural wine, we just assume it's like morally superior. <laughs> so it it does a good job of kind of questioning our assumptions about wines. Anyway, that's in The Cut, which is New York Magazine's lifestyle and fashion magazine. And if you just Google all those things, you'll find it. I just want to thank our fabulous panelists. Wow, what an episode. I learned so much. I feel like I need to inform everyone I know in the wine industry about all these holes in our knowledge, all these things that we should be shouting about. Thank you, Stephen Satterfield. Um, you can find Stephen online at whetstonemagazine.com. That's whetstone uh, with an H, is in the stone you sharpen your knives on. And you can find Deborah Parker Wong online at deborahparkerwong.com. Martin, where can our listeners find you? Catherine, uh, reyeswinegroup.com is where you can find me. And I think for this episode, it is, it is appropriate to mention the nonprofit that I co-founded with uh, amazing individuals in, in the wine trade in 2020, and that is wineunify.org. Thank you, Martin. Um, and listeners, you can find me, Catherine Cole, at catherinecole.com, and more importantly, at thefortop.org. And listeners, we want to hear your thoughts on human rights in the wine industry, so please visit thefortop.org where you can find our social media handles. Um, please tweet at us or Instagram message us, however you want to get in touch. We do want to hear from you. Please subscribe to The Four Top on your favorite podcast app and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts so that others can find the pod. Signing out here from the High Fiber Protein Pack City of Portland, Oregon. Thank you all so much for listening. Thanks to our panelists and bye-bye. This has been The Four Top Podcast. Catherine Cole is our executive producer, Izzy Kramer is our senior producer, and I'm Keelan King, sound supervisor. We are also assisted by audio editor, Michelle Richards, our production assistant, Rachel Grossman, and our social media assistants, Lex Rule and Nick Tool. Please visit our website, thefortop.org, to learn more about us, listen to back episodes, reach out to us on social media, and purchase books written by our amazing panelists. And if you have not already subscribed to The Four Top on iTunes, NPR One, or Spotify, please do so and leave us a rating. Stay safe out there, and thanks for listening. Oh, oh wait a minute. Are, are you still there? Oh, well, if you're still listening, then I need to tell you something. I need to tell you about the fabulous swag over at sparklingwineanytime.com. Sparkling Wine Anytime is, of course, your favorite new book about all things bubbly, but it is also a wonderful website designed by our team, Lex and Rachel, and we have gifts and goodies galore for you. We have sparkling wine themed beach towels, teas, cocktail napkins, fancy wine flasks, adorable tote bags, and more. And guess what? Your purchase will help to support a favorite cause of ours, Aivoy, that's A-H-I-V-O-Y, check it out, which provides education and career training to vineyard stewards in the Willamette Valley. So it's a win-win for everyone, and who doesn't love sparkling wine anytime? Please head to sparklingwineanytime.com. We would love to see you there. Thanks. We love you all. You're wonderful. Kiss, kiss. <laughs>